how to build your business acumen, take the knowledge, the experience, the tools that we may have given you in a course uh, as a graduate, or if I've never been through one of your uh, acumen learnings courses, introduce you to some tools that will help you to be able to listen to these earnings calls and make sense of them, be able to use them in your decision making, in your actions, as you work internally with your own organization, or maybe externally with a company you're selling into, or a partner that you're working with, or in some cases, just to help you from your own personal investment. But looking forward to spending some time with you as you get going. I wanna make sure we're comfortable with some of the tools today. So first tool I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a quick poll question. Just wanna get a feel for, is this your first time or not? So let let me open up my polls here and I'm going to go ahead and ask you this question. Uh, have you attended this webinar before? We do these on a, uh, a monthly basis and we cover all sorts of industries. Last, week, uh, last month it was General Meals. Uh, we've done Costco, I think, the, uh, before that. We've done healthcare. We've done oil and gas. We've done consumer products. Love to get a feel for if you've participated in one of these before. Now, these are, um, when you use the polling, make sure you hit that submit button. It'll allow you to select, but you have to submit for it to calculate it for you uh, to see if this is... Um, uh, be able to get your results there. So yes, as I said, we do these every month. Every month. Now we do it for multiple reasons. One reason is for any graduates of our program to take the tools and knowledge they learned in their program to continue to apply it, to be able to get better at understanding the business and financial strategies of the companies they work with, the companies they serve, or the companies they may be interested in. We also provide it for anybody who has an interest in building their capabilities. So you don't have to have gone through one of our courses to be able to get some benefit and value out of this. Of course, we're also very interested in providing this great material we've had a chance to work with, 30 of the Fortune 50, and providing business and financial acumen training training for the global uh, or Fortune 500 uh, companies. And we'd love to have a chance to provide it for your company if you think this is a value to you. It looks like we've got us today. Um, boy, about 43%. You're brand new. Well, welcome. Good to have you here. The rest of us have been here. Uh, thank you uh, for coming back. And hopefully this continues to build and, and add value to what you're doing. Well, let's make sure we're comfortable with that chat box as well. So have that open. And as Bailey suggested there's a send to category. Make sure it says to everyone so we can all see each other, uh, our responses, et cetera. And so that just to make sure we're comfortable doing it, will you mind just put, open that box up and go ahead and type in where you're calling in from? We're calling in from Salt Lake City, Utah, or just sat, oh, let me spell that right. Salt <laughs> Lake, can't type and talk at the same time. Salt Lake City, Utah. Just a little bit, oh, there you go, Utah was off as well. Can't type and talk at the same time, but just a little bit south of that, about an hour south. If you're familiar with uh, the Sundance Film Festival, we're just on the south side of uh, the mountain, Mount Tippinogus, and on the north side is where we have Sundance. So that's kind of our uh, where we're located. Our claim to fame is we had the wonderful opportunity to host the world in 2002, 20 years ago. Can you believe that? It's been 20 years ago uh, in the Winter Olympics. So it looks like we got people from all over the United States. So welcome, welcome. Good to have you. Do I have anybody international? To oh, Qatar, welcome, welcome. Sandra, good to have you here. Uh, others as well. Well, it's good to have everybody here. Looks like we're comfortable using that chat box. Feel free to use that throughout today. As Bailey described, I'm not the only person on here. I've got some colleagues here. We'll try and help answer questions as we go throughout our experience. So as we get going today, let me start with a, a second poll question. The question is, you're coming to this uh, earnings call lab, how to listen to the earnings call. What, what it is the CEO wants you to know uh, earnings call lab? And my question that I have for you today is, When's the last time you listened to an earnings call? I'm going to open that poll real quickly here. When's the last time you had a chance to listen to an earnings call? Now, it could be your own uh, company if you're part of a publicly traded company. Uh, it could be a customer that you're selling into. Uh, it could be uh, some company you're just interested in understanding. I'll tell you, if you're, if you're trying to get better at your uh, ability to invest, well, boy, the more you can understand the fundamentals of the company you're selling into uh, can really help you build your portfolio. For example, there's a lot of swings that have happened in profitability and cash flows in companies over the last two and a half years since the pandemic. If you just look at the numbers themselves, you can see th companies really uh, uh, seeing decreases in their profitability. But in the end, you look at it and you understand that 
What's behind the numbers? In the end, there's a lot of write downs that have happened because of global economy impacts, because of commodity pricing in the oil and gas industry that really don't suggest that the company's any worse off than it was before. As they start to come at new pricing here in the oil and gas, you're seeing significant growth and significant opportunity with these companies. So a better understanding of these companies, what they're trying to do, why they're doing it, how are their financial numbers uh, looking? can help you not only in your day-to-day -day activity in your own company, the customers you sell into, but also as you think of kind of your investment portfolio. So as we look at it here today, uh, it looks like most of us have done it this year, 74%, excellent, excited to do that. I hope for some of you that came back, the, the majority of you that have come back, you're using this tool. You may have already looked at Shell even, or ready to kind of jump in and add insights as we get going today. So I hope uh, you feel comfortable to do that. Well, as you think about these earnings calls, they happen on a quarterly basis. If you're new to this, they happen on a quarterly basis. And uh, it's a chance for companies to share both a little bit of their kind of prepared remarks, what they did, uh, where they're trying to go, how they're performing, as well as give analysts a chance to ask questions in clarity. As you think about this, these opportunities that happen on a quarterly basis, they're kind of a hidden gem meaning not a lot of people participate in these. Uh, a lot of employees kind of uh, look for the kind of Reader's Digest version. Uh, they may not even know, uh, know that they exist. And, and as you think about one of the challenges that executives face today, I got a couple stats that are kind of interesting, and here's one of them. The first stat is this, that 95% of employees uh, don't understand the company's strategy and objectives. Now you might say to me, Brent, come on now, uh, here at my company, we know, we know the strategies very well, we're very clear on what it is. If you're in a company anywhere uh, from, say, 500 employees to thousands of employees, at some point you find yourself kind of looking at your functional role, very focused on your functional role. What we find after 20 years of experience is that our senior leaders are doing everything they can to squeeze the dollars out of the financial statements, create greater profitability and cash flow. And as employees, we tend to kind of look at things very functionally focused. I'm in sales, I'm in operation, I, I focus on, now that's absolutely valuable. But business and financial acumen, these earnings calls are a chance to step back for a moment. Get the big picture. Where are we currently at? Where do we want to go and how are we going to get there? And then with your functional expertise, go back and execute on it. Well, the challenge the CEOs face is 95% of employees don't understand their strategy. Here's another stat that might surprise you. 90% of employees don't understand the important key financial metrics. Metrics like cash flow, free cash flow, uh, EBIT or EBITDA, return on capital employed, e earnings per share, all these metrics and measures that get thrown around in these earnings calls. So here's the challenge you face as a CEO. How do you get your employees to understand your business? Understand your strategies, your key metrics and how they can impact those key metrics. If you're a large corporation, globally dispersed, such as uh, a company like uh, Shell. Here we got the CEO, Ben Van Buren, uh, the CEO of Shell. Now, as you look at Shell, it's one of the largest uh, international uh, uh, oil and gas companies, fully integrated oil and gas. All that means is they have everything from accessing the oil, what they call upstream, the midstream, which kind of gathers it, processes it, transport it, and then the downstream, which are the refineries that produce the oil, the, dis uh, the diesel, kerosene, uh, 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 all the different uh, uh, methane, propane, all the different uh, plastics that we get. It's amazing what comes out of uh, oil, the byproducts of oil, what they produce. Most of what you're sitting at your table, if you have any plastic, it comes from oil. There's a lot of things that come from oil in our global environment. But here he is, the CEO of one of the largest organizations, about 82,000 employees, and he's dispersed as you look at kind of where they're located, 70 different countries. Oops, let me go back there, hit the wrong button. Uh, in a day in, day out, customer focused organization serving more than 1 million commercial and industrial customers, but 32 million customers in over 46 retail, 46,000 retail service stations every single day. Uh, coming out of a pandemic with a high price, oil price going over $100 a barrel, it's below $100 a barrel, but it had been hovering much lower than that. During the pandemic, it actually went into negative territory, meaning they were actually, it, it, instead of $100 a barrel, it was negative dollars a barrel. So big swings in commodity pricing, big swings in supply as well as demand. And then you're dealing with geopolitical issues of the challenges in Ukraine. And this whole global energy transition, you're the CEO, what is it you want your employees to know? 
You're dealing with 95% potentially of employees that don't understand your key metrics and measure or don't understand your strategy. 90% of employees do, potentially don't understand your key metrics and measure. And you're dealing with all these global economic environments that you're dealing with. So what is it you want your, your employees to understand? Or what do you want your employees need? What is it you need your employees to know? Well, it's not just your employees. What is it your customers? You want them to know. I mean, boy, we're frustrated, are we not? We're paying four, five, six dollars a barrel. If you're up in Canada, where my wife's from, man, we're talking like eight dollars. Uh, uh, as you look at, uh, uh, it's a liter, uh, uh, two fifty a liter, or whatever it is up there. I mean, significant cost. So, what does you want your customers to know? What about your shareholders to know? And finally, any sort of partnerships or s supply chain groups that you're working with. What does you want them to know? Well, that's what these uh, are, are all about. These earnings calls a chance for them to communicate to all those groups here's kind of where we're currently at here's where we want to go and here's what we're going to do to get there and, and a chance for analysts and investors to say well wait a second i you say this but your performance is suggesting this so a bit of clarification and clarity and what i'm going to suggest to you today is i'm going to provide a tool i'm going to walk you through a process and a tool with this process and tool, any earnings call you want to look at, you'll be able to quickly assess both the strategic focus of the company as well as their core financial metrics and measures. And the end goal is to say, okay, so based upon what I understand, what am I going to do with it? If it's my own company, I'm going to sit down with my manager and have a great conversation about, here's what I hear our executives talking about. Here's what I think we can do within our functional role. And can I get your support to do that? If, if it's you're looking at maybe a competitor, you may talk to your sales organization, think here's how we can difference. Here's what I'm hearing them talking about. Well, what can we do to differentiate ourselves? Or if it's just individual, you want to understand yourself and what you can do. Talk with a colleague up here. Here's what I think this company's doing, and here's the benefits I think I could do if I invested in. My promise and guarantee after 20 years in business with this tool, and as you do it two to three quarters consecutively with whatever company you want to look at, you absolutely will build your credibility, you'll build your career, and you'll build this company. As we work with, uh, we do about a thousand training sessions a year. Like I said, 30 of the Fortune 50, many of the Fortune 500. Invariably, uh, we find those individuals who continue to use these tools beyond the course in consecutive quarters, they'll get it. You'll know more about many of the employees in your organization. If you're selling into an organization, they're going to say, how come you know so much about my business? Uh, it's incredible how just taking an hour a quarter on a company you're interested in can really move the needle for you. So that's what we want to do. So I'm going to give you a process, as I said, and then I'm going to give you a tool. So let me talk about the process. There are three steps in, prepare, in, in going through these earnings calls. You need to prepare for them, you need to analyze them, and then you need to apply them, do something with them. So with that in mind, here's what I want to do. I'm going to walk you through each stage of those, and I'm going to have you interact with some of the activities that we do in the tool itself. At the end of the call, I'll give you access to the tool, so don't worry. You're going to get it. You don't have to take a bunch of screenshots or whatever. You'll get access to it at the end of the call. So let's talk about the prepare phase. First of all, let me just give you uh, earnings call 101. These calls happen anywhere from about 45 minutes to a, an hour and a half. Most common is about 50 minutes to an hour is what you're looking at. In these calls, you're going to have the first part of it was typically the prepared remarks. Now, if you listen to Shell's, it's, it, it was interesting. Their call, they do a video. The video itself was about eight minutes is all. Now, typically, these executives will do somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes of the call, and then they'll turn it over to the second part, which is the Q&A. Now, these Q&As, it's not for you and I to necessarily ask the questions. There's very few companies that allow the individual investor to ask the questions. Majority of what's these large investment firms where their analysts who track the stock will be able to ask questions. They go into Q, they have a chance to ask at least two questions, get clarification on what's communicated by their executive team. As I said, they're about an hour to an hour and a half. Uh, as you look at this, the first step in uh, the prepare phase, you've got to access the call. Let me explain how you do that. There's this great website. You may have heard of it. It's called Google. All you have to do is just open a, a Google Doc and, and just jump, uh, jump in and type in what you're looking for. For this situation, I want Shell. I want Q2. I want earnings. Uh, uh, earnings, whatever it is, I, uh, wh whatever you're looking for, earnings call, earnings uh, transcript, whatever you might look at. I'll just do earnings for now. And you'll look here, I got all sorts of information. 
Now, what I'm going to look for is, for me, you'll notice this first one, offshoretechnology.com. That's a third-party uh, group giving a little bit of data on the company. You're going to see stuff like Reuters, who gives information. Uh, you'll see like Motley Fool, Seeking Alpha, all these different groups that provide it. I like to go directly to the company itself. So I'm looking for something that says shell.com. So I jump right here. I click on that. What do I find? Boom, I'm right there. See how easy that was? Less than 30 seconds, I'm there. I'm in there. Now, when, now, if it's prior to the call, I wouldn't have all this information. This call happened on July 28th. So it's, it's been uh, 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 about a month ago that this happened. And, and so you got a bunch of information after the call that they provide. Prior to the call itself, there would just be a spot where you could register for the call itself. So I click on that registration link. I put my information in. It actually can send you an invite. So you have it ready to go. You go listen to the call itself. Well, because the call has already happened, they're actually giving you all the different data information. You want the quarterly press release, it's right there. This is where they're gonna walk through kind of their performance. This is what they submit to investors, provided as a resource to kind of give an update of what happened, overview of uh, the quarter itself. Here I've got actual financial data. So they're actually giving me the financial statements. Look at this. Uh, as you look at kind of their initial financial data, they got quarterly information, they got half year. This is their income. How much income do they generate in Q2 of 2022? 18 billion, 40 million uh, uh, US dollars and versus uh, the quarter one, which was 7 billion. A year ago that time, they generated 3.4 billion. Right there in front of us, they give us that data, real nice information. Now, uh, one of the things I love to access, if they have access to it, is right here. It's their quarterly uh, slide deck. This is the slides that they took analysts through. So all the data, it gives a nice summary of what's going on. So I always look for something like that. The last thing I'm going to look for is a transcript. Now, as I look through here, I'm not seeing a transcript. So there's a bunch of third-party websites. The one I like to do, you might jot it down if you're interested in getting it. It's called Seeking Alpha. Now, I don't get paid for this. There's no benefits of me sharing you this one, but it's the one I like. You go in there. Oh, it's trying to make me log in. I don't want to log in. Anyways, you go into Seeking Alpha, and you can actually access the transcript. You can go back to Google and just do a shell Q2. Get my glasses on so I can see here. Shell Q2 uh, earnings call transcript. So it's going to give me all sorts of locations where I can access. Here's Seeking Alcova transcript, the one I was trying to get to. Right here, I've got the transcript. Word by word, what was communicated, who said what, who were the key leaders that were on, who were the analysts that were on as well. So in the end, all that information. Now, if you want to summarize, what do you want to access? Number one, I want to get access to the call itself. So I'm looking for a transcript. I'm going to listen to it. Number two, I want to get access to their financial information. So I'm looking for that financial doc. Now, for me, uh, uh, the last thing I look for is the slide. Those, those three things are kind of, for me, the most helpful resources I go through that experience. So that's how you locate the call. A quick Google search, whatever company you're looking for, you're trying to access that. Now, the next step is you review your notes in preparation for the call. Well, you might be saying, Brett, what, what notes are you talking about? Well, if you've never done it before, you're probably not going to have any notes. But guess what? You can do that exact same search, and you can look at Q1 information. You want to do a quick review of where their numbers were in Q1, what were some of their strategies? Review that, and so then when you're listening to Q2, you can see what changed, what happened, what they said they were going to do, did it actually happen, et cetera. Or once you start doing this on a regular basis, your, this tool that I give you becomes the notes that you review. You just grab that from the last quarter, review what we, you, you jotted down about their performance, and then you're ready to go for the call. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do it with others. I find that if I do it with my colleagues, my peers, my direct reports, get together, I get more value out of it. If you're a leader, I can't think of a better thing to do than to sit down with your team, take an hour, and review the call. Uh, if, you, if you're feeling like, boy, that's too much time, well, maybe you review it and just share some of the highlights with your team. In the end, the outcome should always be, how can I apply it? Based upon what I've heard, what can I do? And that tool helps you to get that. But doing it as a team is a great way to kind of build your capabilities around this uh, uh, activity. So that's the prepare phase. Let's talk the analyze phase. And this is the heart. This is the meat of what you do. In order to do the analyze phase, I want to do a quick review of a simple framework we use in all of our courses. Everybody who's been through the courses, open your chat box. You're going to help me do a quick review of these five drivers. So we talk about uh, these, these are five fundamental drivers. I'll suggest you to these. These are the fundamental drivers 
whether you're a $184 billion revenue generating for a half year uh, shell or a small mom and pop organization, these are the fundamental drivers every company focuses on. So they focus on cash, profit, assets, growth, and people. Now this tool becomes a great resource as you kind of listen to these calls, listening for what are they talking about? Are they describing cash? Is it profit? Is it asset? Is it growth or is it people? You can also use this as you communicate to your team. How are our decisions? How are the things we're doing going to impact each one of these drivers? So let's talk about real quick. Cash is blank. Put it in the chat box if you would. Fill in the blank. Cash. As you think about the importance of cash in a business, cash is blank. What would you say? King is the most common phrase I get. Royalty is a great one. Companies, oxygen supply, Andrea. Oh, good to see you, Andrea. Uh, fuel. Absolutely. It is the lifeblood of a company. If a company runs out of cash, they die. You go to 2020 and the oil and gas industry as oil price dropped as dramatically as the global economy shut down. People weren't traveling. People weren't buying fuel. All of a sudden, if you're out of gas, if you're out of cash, you're not going to survive. You have companies here in North America, a company known Chesapeake was what they call an upstream uh, company, went into bankruptcy. If you did not have cash during that time, you did not survive. If you were on our, on our uh, earnings calls last year, we talked about Boeing. Boeing had to borrow $42 billion to survive. Cash is vitally important in a company. There's two metrics companies you typically look at. One is called cash and cash equivalents. The others are cash flow. You can see all those metrics in the cash flow statement. So cash is king, it's vitally important, it's the oxygen supply of a company. Let's talk profitability. When you talk profitability, there's two levers you have to impact profitability. You can increase one line item or you can decrease other line items. What are those levers? Do you remember from our course? Jamin, it looks good. Let's see if anybody else agrees with you. I agree with you. Let's see. Yep. Oh, Jonathan said, yep, absolutely. You want to grow your revenue which by the way is also known as sales. Those are the same terms in business. While managing your costs, or if you look at it for a whole company, we're talking about expenses, right? Oh, excuse me there. My, I'm trying to write around something here. Expenses. Excuse me. You got the point. So we want to increase revenue or reducing uh, costs. Now, how do I increase revenue? I can do it two ways. I can sell more or I can increase my price. Now, in oil and gas, who controls pricing? Put it in the chat box if you know that. I know I've got some oil and gas people on here. Who controls pricing? Can Shell go out and say, hey, today I'm going to charge $120 a barrel, even though it's about $87 to $90 a barrel? Jonathan saying, no, it's the market. Absolutely. This is called supply and demand. Oil and gas is a commoditized market. It means in the end, there's not a lot of control they have. So for, for oil and gas companies, it's all about volume. All their forecasts are built upon different pricing models. At $50 a barrel, here's our production schedule. At $75 a barrel, at $100 a barrel, $125, what do I do based upon what the pricing? In oil and gas, we call it their price taker. Which means they whatever the price is, they got to adapt for that. Of course, you go through COVID where you see price drops dramatically. And the height of Q2 average was $108.10 a barrel uh, was the price in, in, for the first half of the year. It's kind of average realized price. The last time we were at that rate would be about 2013. And if you listen to the call, uh, their CEO talked a lot about this. What's changed since 2019? In fact, 2013, the first half of the year was 107, I think 0.5 if I remember correctly. So $107.50. So we're very comparable, yet yet we're talking, you know, almost nine years or nine years uh, different. So what's the outcome of that? How does that impact profitability? Of course, some of the metrics they'll look at is EBITDA. Yeah. Uh, which is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization, or just EBIT, earning for before interest and tax. If you want to find out what's going on from a, a, a profitability, you're going to look at their income statement. And it's incredible. Honestly, it's the best I've ever seen. I've been doing oil and gas for 16 years. And these are some incredible numbers. We'll look at those in just a moment here. Of course, we want to grow profitable. This is probably the one you hear a lot talked about in your business, knowing what is the key profitability metric in your business. It could be a gross profit. If you're a very a manufacturing based organization, looking at how much you're making on each product, uh, operating profit or operating income, operating earnings, all the same thing. Uh, uh, also known as EBIT 
or EBITDA. Some companies will talk about earnings before tax or IBT, income before tax. These are all, figure out what your core profitability metric, the net profit margin everybody talks about, but they typically have a core operating profit measure. And that's what you want to understand. Of course, assets, anything you own or control, which has value. You think about a, a company like Shell, what would you guess are some of their assets? What do they own and control, which has value? Put it in my chat box, will you? Company like Shell, what do they own or control which has value? Okay, fields, property and pipelines, absolutely. They're fully in rigs, absolutely. Uh, all this equipment, they're a heavy asset driven organization versus some a company like Visa. <laughs> How much asset, what are the assets of Visa? Well, it's a technology, it's an infrastructure, but they don't have tremendous equipment per se. Uh, in the end, different companies have different amount of assets. Well, I've got a lot of assets. It costs me a lot to maintain those assets, to deploy those assets, et cetera. So, so all those equipment, refineries, IP, locations, all that is investments they've made into their asset base. Now, if you talk about assets, we talk about what we call asset strength versus asset utilization. Asset strength is all about how financially strong are you? If you have a significant amount of debt against your assets, then you're not going to be in a very strong position. During the Great Recession of 20, uh, 20, oh, uh, 2008, uh, Lehman Brothers goes out of business. Their equity position, meaning how much... Uh, equity did they have in their business was only about 3%. So the market drops, there's no longer cash available. They weren't in a strong financial position to withstand that, they go out of business. Companies have been around for over a hundred years. First companies who have 25, 30%, 35%, even upwards to 45%, they're a very strong position. They're able to access cash. Well, if you increase your asset strength, well, you're going to actually decrease the concept which we call asset utilization and that's how you utilize those assets so there's constant balance between asset strength how financially strong we are versus deploying those assets to grow and expand your business so a real balance that you're looking at and the balance sheet helps you to see that balance between the assets themselves what are the liabilities against those assets versus how much equity do your shareholders have in those assets of course growth is what investors expect the whole market is driven by that of course people are what makes it happen so with that framework in mind, that simple introduction to the five drivers, here's how I want to introduce you to the tool. Using this framework is a great way to assess the strategic focus of any company. And here's how it works. As you listen to the call, all you're doing is listening to it or you're reading it, whatever it is. Every time you hear something about cash, maybe they talk about increasing dividends or they talk about getting access to new debt or they're paying down their debt uh, or they're using cash to fund the acquisition of new assets. You just start putting slash marks. As they talk about stuff about profitability, increased pricing, increasing volume, earnings per share, EBITDA, you put slash marks. As I'm investing capital to buy new assets, I actually also come down here and mark assets. When the end, as you're listening to these calls, you begin to see a picture, a framework, a theme. What are they really talking about? Now, don't worry if you've never been through our course, I give you a definition right here. Here's a definition of what we mean by cash. Well, not only that, I got trigger words there. <laughs> We've thought of everything. Here's some trigger words for you. Anytime I may hear anything about a source or use of cash for dividends, distribution, stock buybacks, debt. If I hear any of those terms, I'm putting a slash mark here. If I hear EBIT, profit, EBITDA, income, earnings, margin, I'm putting slash marks on profitability. So you listen to this call, you put in a bunch of slash marks. At the end of the call, you're just gonna answer four simple questions. The first question is which business drivers seem to get the most attention? And I love the second part of it, and why? What's going on in the market? What's changed? I mean, absolutely, the last two and a half years, the oil and gas has been up and down and all over the place. You then combine it with geopolitical issues in Ukraine, significant impacts. We're seeing it, we're getting impacted by it. That's where inflation's in, hitting us, right? So what is going on? Why are they focused on the drivers they're focused on? Number two is what are the two or three main points the executive was trying to make? What are the goals, trends, or objectives going forward? Or because it's an earnings call, what, what are the key questions the analysts are asking? Now imagine if you did that to your company that's publicly traded or a customer that's publicly traded or a company that uh, you're interested in. And you do it over multiple quarters. What's going to happen? You're going to find yourself, hey, I'm more clear about what their strategy is. I can see whether or not they're actually performing or they're getting the results they want to. I'll give you an example. Everybody's been talking about ESG, environmental, social, uh, uh, 
ESG factors globally. Everybody's talking about these, right? So the environment's a big part of that, right? Zero emissions, everybody's putting their stakes in the ground. Since the new year, with oil and gas in particular, you're hearing about security of access. That, that, why are they talking about that? Well, because in Europe, majority of the oil was coming from Russia. And as they, they have all these um, sanctions against Russia, all of a sudden, do we have access? How do we get access to natural gas? Natural gas has skyrocketed over 11, $12 per thousand cubic feet. I mean, it's significant impacts. So now all of a sudden security becomes a big issue. In the end, what's going on, why it's been an impact. So what are the goals and objectives going forward? And what are the questions that are people are asking? Now, after the call, I always like to look, what happened to their stock price? Did it go up or down? How's the market responding, et cetera? So here's what I want to do. I can walk you through using this just a little bit here. And I can't go through the whole thing, but I got a few quotes. So let's start with our CEO's quote, one of the first quotes he had. And what I want you to do is open the chat box. And as you go through this, I want you to put which of the five drivers do you think they're focused on? Now, first thing as you do this, I want to be clear. This is not an exact science, meaning you and I may read the exact same sentence and you may put a uh, different slash marks in different places. But as we do about a thousand sessions a year globally all throughout the world, we find that the top two or three drivers always come to the top. So let's go through this together. The war in Ukraine continued, destroying lives and disrupting supplies of food and energy and aggravating the life of so many more through high energy prices and cost of living crisis. So which of the five drivers, cash, profit, asset, growth, and people in this first sentence, uh, do you think Mr. Um, Van Bearden is focused on? So Ben kind of says people, profit, and cash. Definitely people for sure, right? Well, but yes, profitability as you think about prices and cap costs. Energy prices are going high, which by the way is going to be a real help for them, right? Uh, but we're feeling that on our pocketbook, right? The impacts of that. Excellent. So definitely people. You got cash. You got some profitability as well in there. Let's look at the next one. And all it all reinforces the importance of getting the balance right. We need a system that provides secure supply. Guess what? Six months ago, you would hear it every once in a while, but it wasn't a big issue. Secure supply. You're hearing it all the time now. Uh, that is reliable and low carbon and affordable. Which five drivers do you think they're focusing on there? It all reinforces the importance of getting the balance right. We need a system that provides secure supply of energy that is reliable, low carbon, and affordable. Excellent. So assets for sure, as you think about the system to be able to supply that, that's definitely going to be assets. Yeah, affordable. You start thinking of profitability again. Uh, low carbon. How would you fit lower carbon? Uh, well, there's some economics, there's some cost side of it too, but you also think about the environment, how it helps people, right? To, to live in a, an environment where they can be more healthy, uh, 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 be good citizens, global environmental citizens, however you want to describe that. Well, let me go to that last one here and we'll, we'll wrap up this first quote here. You're, you're getting it. You're doing very good here. So uh, we need reliable policies that ensure the stable supply of energy products today and significant investment in energy systems of tomorrow. For example, by speeding up reviews for offshore wind projects and allowing the ex accelerated tax depreciation of renewable assets. Now, interesting as you think about that, I, I see this term. That's an easy one. I know at least one of the drivers they're talking about, but this is where you're starting to get a little bit of marketing spin. There's some tax issues in, in uh, the UK where Shell is, is um, uh, headquartered, and, and there's, the, there's a bit of a spin here trying to get that a uh, little influence on some of these tax rules that are coming into play on oil companies in the UK and, and the ability for them to accelerate some of these investments in, in low carbon assets, that's going to help them to make it a profitable decision versus having high costs. You think about, uh, you know, electric cars and you think about wind and solar. Uh, they're getting lower and lower in price, but you go back to when they're first coming out. It's very expensive. Here in North America, for example, I've got uh, 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 a utility provider that will allow me to pay more to access some of these lower cost, energy efficient resources. Now, not everybody's going to do that, right? And so what they're saying here is man, if we can accelerate that tax benefit, I can actually make more investment in some of these. So it's kind of how do we make that cost effective is kind of what we're doing, but also being making uh, the environment a priority here. So yes, you got assets, definitely. You got growth. You got uh, people, again, as you start talking about some of those uh, unique um, uh, low-carbon uh, asset deployment that they're looking at doing. 
Well, folks, that's how you do it. Let me, I got two other quotes. So here's one from their CFO. When you get to the CFO, it's going to be a lot more number type stuff. So which of the five drives? I'll let you read through it. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to read it, but just kind of mark in. What do you see as you read through Sinead Gorman's communication to the market? Which of the five drivers stands out? Give you some uh, hints here. This right here is a very specific term. There you go, a profitability term, absolutely. Strong performance in all of their key groups. EBITDA, I see EBITDA. I immediately see profitability there. Uh, uh, cash flow right there. I'm getting some cash. Buybacks. Now, buybacks could be a couple things, could it not? Because I'm... Six billion dollars. They're they're going to spend six billion dollars in Q3 to buy back shares. That's going to be cash, but it's also a benefit to shareholders. So you can see people there as well. Well, it looks like you got them. So cash, profit, definitely a lot of cash and profitability. Some growth in there as well. Not only do you have uh, a, the prepared remarks, what the executives communicate, but you also have investors. So here's Lydia Rainforth, Managing Director of Barclays, and let's see what she's talking about. So I love the analysts. A lot of people just read the, le the, the communication from the executives, and that's a good start for sure. But what I love about the listening to the analysts, I start to see where they're buying what the executives are saying. They agree. Or whether they're starting to say, wait a second, I don't know that I'm seeing what you're saying here. It's a really nice way to kind of challenge and get accuracy of what they're focused on. So here's Lydia. See what she's focused on. Which of the five drivers do you see standing out there in her communication? Yeah, right here. The moment I see cash flow, I know I'm going to talk about cash for sure. A lot of cash, some growth in there. Really, what's her question? Why are we doing buybacks and not giving more in dividends? If we had more time, we'd talk through what's the difference between buyback and dividend. If not, I'll give you access to an online training at the end of this course at a discounted rate. I'll talk you through some of that. You might look it up, but it, dividends is cash going right to them. Buybacks is your buying back share. So where are you going to take that extra cash? Not only that, can we expect to see that as you continue to go forward? The moment you see that, you don't have to know a lot about their call to know if they're willing to take $6 billion in one quarter and pay it back, you know they're generating good cash. Well, folks, that's how you do it. You see how it works? Pretty simple. Like I said, as you do it, if we were all in a room, we may not get the exact same number of slash marks. But in the end we would all have the top two or three metrics. Everybody would agree. These are the top two or three focus areas of the, what the executives were talking about. So what I did is I went ahead and completed the rest of the tool. The rest of the tool is where you go through, make those slash marks, and here's what I got. Now, I break them up a little bit. Not everybody does it this way. I like to do it this way because I'm kind of seeing the prepared remarks versus the analyst questions. Where's there an alignment in kind of the communication, and where's the, the kind of misalignment? Now, the challenge with this is this, this portion of it was only seven minutes long or just under eight minutes, something like seven to eight minutes, where the rest of the call was an hour long. So you had about an hour, 60 minutes over here, and you then had only seven minutes over here. So you did get a lot of that communication in the video that they presented. But here you go, what, what was, so the first question, which of the five drivers get the most attention? Right here, number one, and number two. Everything else was pretty close, you know, within uh, seven or so of each other. So the question then says, so which business drivers seem to get the most attention and why? What were the two or three main points the executive was trying to make? What's the goals, uh, trends, and objectives going forward? And what are the questions that the analyst asked? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through. We don't have time for us to read and go through the whole call. So I'm going to give you some information here. Now, one thing I'm going to put in the chat box, hopefully this comes through. This is a link to show, it's a long link, but this is, it, it's, it's good. There's no spam here. This is a link to Shell's website where I just was. There is some great information in this um, in their slide deck. And so I'm giving you access to that so you just uh, can kind of see it. I got way more information. I was talking to some of my colleagues here. I got way too much information. I'm going to drag it out. I love oil and gas. I spent a lot of time in the oil and gas industry, so there's a lot of interesting things here. But I'll hopefully try and make it interesting without boring you here. So why assets? Why are they focused on assets? Well, the big issue they're talking about is the secure supply of energy. With Ukraine and the issues there, uh, 
Russia supplies a significant amount of supply to Europe. And so all of a sudden that's kind of taken away by choice and sanctions and other reasons. We got to make sure we have reliable access to this. That's why gas is jumping so much is because Europe uses a lot of natural gas and a big supplier of them uh, is no longer available. So all of a sudden you have less supply, but yet people still want to uh, heat and air condition or whatever they're doing with those resources. And so that's a big issue for them. So what are they doing about that? Shell has been taking action and continue to deliver energy the world needs today. And there's a number of some North Sea projects. I'll let you look at them yourself, but offshore projects that they're doing to help generate more natural gas. This is a jackdaw field, a specific field that they're focused on. They're looking to, that will take care of 6% of UK's natural gas production in years ahead. So a lot of investment in getting access to these reliable, secure supplies. Uh, as you look at the last part of that, is this energy transformation. This is a big topic that a lot of companies are talking about. Let me get back to my slides here is this energy transformation. So why assets? Because that's a big deal. What is the energy transformation? They've made a goal by 2050 to have zero CO2 impacts. Well, that seems like a long way out, you know, what, 28 years away. But today they're making decisions, they're making investments uh, in electric vehicle charging points. You know, they have 46,000 retail outlets. Well, they're looking to do 100,000, greater than 100,000 EV charging points that they're gonna invest in. Uh, integrated gas, uh, you know, uh, taking LNG, liquefied natural gas, and how to use that as a resource. Uh, they're doing all the renewable efforts. So what's interesting is this uh, energy transformation has been talked about at a small level, in my opinion, for many years, but it's been accelerated in the last two and a half years. Everybody, not just the oil and gas industry, everybody's talking about this. And so why assets? Because that's a big part of their initiatives. They're, they're investing in money and assets to increase renewable and energy, uh, more energy, uh, 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 low carbon assets to provide the resources that we all need. We're not really giving up a whole lot of, um, uh, use of those assets and so they're they're trying to come up with the products that are economically viable so that's a big part of it, a lot of questions around energy trans uh, transition so why assets because they're dealing with major global economic impact supply issues trying to get more reliable secure stuff so that and as well as continue their efforts around this energy uh, transition that they're focused on oops so the second driver I want to highlight is cash. Now this, you often don't hear a lot about cash in businesses until they either don't have it or they have a lot of it. <laughs> now folks, they generated a tremendous amount of cash. If I had more time, I'd pull up their cash flow statement. You'd see $33 billion of cash in the first year. If you go back to 2013 and 14, th that was the height of the last oil well, one of the major oil uh, growth efforts. And Exxon was about 46 billion for a year. Cheryl was somewhere around that. In the first half of this year, they've already generated $33.5 billion of cash. Now guys, remember, what is that? That's the difference between all the cash that comes in from their cooperation, minus all the cash that goes out to fund the cooperations. This is cash they can use to invest in more assets, all these low carbon investments that they're looking to do. Uh, they can use that cash to pay down debt. They can use that cash to get money. So why cash? Because they generated a lot. Just in that quarter alone, they generated 18 billion. Now you got to remember, this is after they run their operation. This is leftover cash. So the big question is, what are you going to do with that? A big emphasis of the cash generation and an emphasis that Mr. Van Buren talked about was back in 2013, we were at the same price per barrel, approximately of what we are today. Yet we're generating tremendous more. So why? Why are we able to do that? Well, they high graded their portfolio. You hear this term a lot in the oil and gas. What do they talk about? Basically, the low margin option, they quit selling them. They got out of those business. And then they got more and more efficient in the last nine years and how they can produce, which allows them to actually have 21% reduction of production. They had 21% less production, but yet they generated significant more cash environment. So all these oil and gas companies figure out how to do it more efficient. Some of you are service 
service providers. I have some service provider clients that, that use technologies, AI, to help be more efficient in what they produce. That allows them to generate a lot more cash. Uh, so for them, they're seeing huge results and huge benefits from that. Our upstream portfolio is much more concentrated, uh, leading to 21% lower production, while our upstream cash flow from operation per barrel has increased 74%. Incredible numbers, guys. So yes, energy prices are very high today, but there have been so before. And the real difference is that today we are performing much better in a similar price environment. So they're more efficient in what they do than where they were before. Well, what are the two or three main points they were talking about? Delivered strong results was number one, energy security and transition, number two. Enhanced shareholder distributions, number three. And they actually gave you a nice slide for that. Uh, that's why I gave you this slide. I think it's a great resource. Delivered strong results. What are some of those results? You know, 18 billion in cash flow. Adjusted earnings per sh uh, earnings was 11.5 billion. 24 billion of organic free cash flow in the first half of the year. What that means is growing from their own assets. That of that 33 billion, 24 of it was just growing from within, not in merchant acquisition. The big comment I talked about earlier: energy uh, security and transition is a big focus. Uh, powering progress with focused investment in energy security and accelerating the energy transition. They expect to spend somewhere between 23 to 27 billion in this year in investing in both security and transition. And then there, where's that cash going? They knew it was going to be an issue. They talk about all that uh, uh, being given out to investors. Significant amount. Uh, in fact, just in uh, the last quarter, it was 7.2 uh, or 7.3 billion that they got back to investors in the last quarter. I'm going to forego some of these slides. This is me geeking out a little bit. But again, that's part of that slide deck I put in the chat box. Strong results and volatile times. Here's all the results of their key metrics. Uh, everything is very strong in the first half of this year. If you look at their, um, uh, not only is it strong, it's strong across all segments of their business. Upstream, marketing, chemicals. Uh, this is the renewables group. Uh, it saw significant growth and success. Providing air, energy security and accelerating the energy trans, trans, uh, transition. A lot of investment that they're doing to figure out ways to make it low carbon, high efficiency to, for the energy of the future is a big investment strategy for them. And then, of course, getting that money back to investors was a big uh, part of their conversation. So what are the goals and trends and objectives going forward? Well, one of the key things they talked about is continue portfolio focus and high grading. They're getting out of the businesses that have low margin opportunities. Decisive in their actions. They're making decisions quickly in this kind of uh, challenging geopolitical environment. And then building a hydrogen economy, that ability to have low carbon impacts. And so they talk about that. Could you? There's some assets, divestments. They, they talked about $80 billion dollars of divestment, getting out of low uh, margin opportunities and then taking that cash and investing in, in greater high margin opportunities. Decisive action, fast involving geopolitical environment. They have a nice summary of what they've done in their relationship with Russia and, and how they've, the sanctions and how they've approached that. If you want to look at that, it's in that slide deck that I offered to you. And then building that hydrogen economy. This is the, this is the low cost energy, uh, low carbon impacts of the future is what they're uh, creating here. And they talked about some of the assets that they're developing in that. So what were the key questions analysts were raising or what were they asking about? It's right here. Where are you gonna, what are you going to do with that cash? Why buybacks versus dividends? What, what's your strategy? That was a huge. In fact, of the eight or nine analysts asked question, about six of them asked that same question, variations of the question. The last things were energy security and energy transition. So folks, that's the tool. We've got through that first part. What do I know now? I know they generate a tremendous amount of cash. Why? Because they were able to high grade their assets, but also the time where supply went off the charts. You add the geopolitical impacts, it continued to increase, and so they're, they're generating a tremendous amount of cash, which means they have more cash to invest and accelerate that movement to low carbon opportunities. Um, that also means they have more cash available to get back to investors. And so the big question is for analysts, why buybacks and why not dividends? So the next tool I want to introduce you to is the navigating the financial. With this resource and any financial communication, you can quickly assess the financial performance of a company. So here's how it works. It brings the five drivers together on the left-hand side. Some of the key metrics most companies look at. Now, these aren't all the oil and gas companies. For example, you're not seeing EBITDA, which is a key 
uh, oil and gas metric. If you look at an oil and gas company, you can do the same calculations to get an EBITDA margin by getting the EBITDA calculation divided by my total revenue. But this is the most common metrics or measures that companies use, and that's why we put it in this tool. Here's how it works. What you do is you look at what items am I looking for. It tells you what line item in the statements do you have to look for, and the genius of it, in my opinion, is it tells you what statement to go to. So if I want to access my cash and cash equivalent, what statement do I need to go to based upon my tool? Put it in the chat box, if you would. What statement do we want to go to to be able to access the cash and cash equivalent for Shell? based on the tool if i want to see the cash and cash equivalent i come over here i look okay cash and cash equivalent income statement no balance sheet there you go it's right there balance sheet so i go to my balance sheet now you don't have it in front of you so i got it right here balance sheet as i look at cash and cash equivalent i know it's going to be an asset i also know it's a, a current asset something that either is cash or will convert to cash in less than one year period of time so cash and cash equivalents right here how much cash did they have on hand as of june 30th 2022 put in my chat box can you see it there yeah thirty-eight thousand nine hundred seventy dollars right jamin greg no that's actually 38 billion nine hundred and seventy million dollars they have tremendous cash available so you plug that in you got your number now I can look at that and I can say, well, what happened? It actually increased year over year. Why did it increase? Well, I'll show you why it increased. Look at this next number. I want to get my cash flow from the core operations. As I go to cash flow from core operations, I'm looking right here, the cash flow statement. Again, you don't have it, so I'm going to put it up in front of you. Here we go. I want cash flow from core operating activities. In the quarter, it was $18,655,000,000. For the year, it was $33,470,000,000 dollars. Look at how much cash generation improvement since last year. A year ago this time, $12 billion, $6 billion more cash generated in the quarter, uh, in Q2 2022 versus Q2 2021. So there's your number. Well, let's do a profit one. We want to get that total revenue. What statement do I go to? Let's make sure we're comfortable using the tool because you're going to get it here in just a minute or two. There you go. I go to that income statement. In fact, for the next... Uh, three metrics, I'm going to the income statement on every one. So let's do those. I want to get my total revenue number. I jump to that statement. I come up here. And of course, we're doing quarterly numbers. You can do it on quarterly or annual. The one I'm doing right now is quarter. I look right here. I've got revenue, but I also have other income generation. So I jump right here. I'm going to use this number, 103. Now, you may want to say, no, I just want specific revenue. You can do that. But this is the number that I use, 103.83. I bring that over, plug that in. I've got my revenue number. Now I want my net income number. I go to the same statement, come down here, looking for the income attributable to Shell shareholders. So I want this number right here, 1804. Now I'm ready to do my net income margin. I plug in my net income divided by total revenue. That's all margin is, is it's whatever the profit number is divided by total revenue gives me a 17.5%. Any guesses to what the typical S&P 500 net income margin it was in 2021. Let's just use that. On average, anybody have a guess? Is this higher or is this lower than the typical S&P 500 average? Jamin, 10 is usually where it's been. In 2021, it was about 12. But absolutely, it, this is way higher than they typically get. In fact, usually Shell is somewhere between about an 8 to 12%. When you're over $100 a barrel, they would definitely be up at the 12%. But that shows how efficiently they've been able to... Uh, uh, run their business as they as they think of inter, uh, uh, efficiencies that they've been able to draw out of their assets. Pretty pretty impressive. Okay, well, folks, we don't have time to go through the whole thing. So what I do, boom, I did it all for you. Here we go. You don't have to you don't have to go through it yourself because I'm going to give it to you right here if I can get my slide to advance. Here's the numbers. So here what we've got. We got Q2 2021 versus Q2. Uh, excuse me, Q2 2022 versus Q2 2021. I look at how big the margin. Of course, we'd expect that. Remember, we're still in the heart of COVID in 2021. That's just when all the, here in North America, that's when all the uh, medication came out, all the, all the vaccinations came out. You can also look at it if you want to look at it for half year. So here's the half year numbers. First half of last year, uh, or this year versus first half of last year. You can see margins are better. You see a lot of growth in their top line revenues as well as other revenue. But we also got good re revenue increases last year because you remember 2021, we did a bunch of write downs. Well, you can look at that in comparison to competitors. Here's Exxon's numbers versus Shell. Very similar, a little bit more in revenue on an Exxon, but you're getting more profitability on a Shell. 
What does that tell me? If they're getting revenue, they're all playing with the same dollar amounts. It's about their cost side. They're able to do it more efficiently than Exxon was for whatever reason. You'd have to go into the numbers to see exactly why. But you see growth numbers. You see uh, equity ratios a little bit down as they've invested more of their dollars. As you start to invest in these low carbons, you're going to see your uh, asset number go up, but your, your equity ratio may go down because you're using debt to invest in those things. You can also do it on any company. For those who were with us last month, we looked at General Mills. Here's their numbers in comparison to Shell. Very different companies, right? You're talking about a consumer product company versus an oil and gas company. Very different numbers. So that's the tool. Well, at this point, I, I know what's the strategies. I know the numbers. Now it's all about application. How can I do something with this? Here at Acumen Learning, our core focus of everything we do is application. We work with forty of the fish, fortune. We work with thirty of the Fortune fifty, and these are some of the outcomes. And the more you do this, the more you work on it. If you do it and do something with it, you're going to have improved performance in your business and function. You'll increase your ability to collaborate, improve your upward communication, improve employee engagement. Increase your business focus and improve your teamwork by taking these tools and doing something with them. So that's what you've got to do at the end. To know and not to do is not to know. And so I want to get you to do something with it. So here's what I took away from it. For me, as I look at what I saw in this call, in the tool, in exercise three, you're looking at what new insights did you gain? What are you going to do about it? And who are you going to talk to about it? For me, best I've seen oil and gas performance in all my years of working in oil and gas, the best I've seen. The cash generation and growth over the past six months has just been incredible. This whole conversation about where they get, how are they rewarding investors? That's a big deal for all these analysts and investors as well. This energy security versus energy transformation, that dynamic of getting low carbon, but also wanting to make sure you have access to the resources. That was a huge insight for me. And then of course, uh, Already, they're starting to see benefits from their renewable energy. Most companies that are doing this renewable energy aren't getting the benefits. It's costing them more than, than what, what they're generating. But Shell's starting to get benefits. $1.5 billion EBITDA contribution in uh, the first half of this year. So that's pretty significant. So what would I do with this? Well, I'm going to take it and use it. I work with many oil and gas. I'm going to integrate this into my conversations with my, my clients. I'm also going to look at uh, uh, sharing this with my team members, my clients, as well as new customers. Of course, if anybody's here is with us with Shell, we'd love to work with you. I want to work with you. I'd love to learn what you're doing and how to help your employees understand how your company makes money and how to make good decisions around that money-making process. Well, folks, that's the tool. So the last part of it, the most important thing is do something with it. Go have that conversation. Sit down with your manager and share, what did I learn and how can I use this in my role? If, it, if you analyze the customer or partner, sit down with your sales organization and sit, talk about how you can differentiate your products or service in the market. And, and then if you analyze the benchmark or competitor, think about how we can compete within the industry and differentiate ourselves with competition. Have a conversation with your uh, manager. In the end, that's the core. The outcome is to get those ideas. I've learned something. Here's what I think I should do. Now, let me get the support I need to move forward. Well, folks, that is the tool. Analyze, uh, prepare, analyze, and apply. Now, remember that second step was to go ahead and review your notes. Well, if you go through this process, filling out this doc, that becomes your notes. I've got it ready. So when Q3 comes around, I'm ready to jump in and listen to Shell and see what changed. What they said they were going to do versus what I actually saw is a great resource for you. So as we wrap up today, here's my last part. The challenge. Who will you analyze? Put in the chat box. I've given you the tool. I've watched you through how to do it. Shell's done tremendously well. Who are you going to analyze? Is it somebody you work for? Somebody you're going to sell to? Somebody you want to compete against? Somebody company you want to partner with? Invest in? Interested in? Or next month on the 28th of September, we're going to meet with we're going to go through Netflix. Very different industry, very different impact was the glory of the late uh, 1990s and all through most of the 2000s. And now in 2022, 900,000 subscribers left in the last quarter. What's going to happen for their quarters? It'll be interesting to look at that. Uh, excellent. Love to have you look at that and go through that. Well, let me give you the access to it. Here we go. Go to acumenlearning.com. We're going to put that in the chat box. You have that available. Acumenlearning.com forward slash webinar. The first thing you're going to have there is you can actually uh, get access to this workbook. Download it. Use it as much as you can. I highly recommend. I'd invite you. If this is your first time, come back to the next two or three. After two or three of these, you're going to be pretty comfortable with it. But next time, actually go listen to 
Q2 earnings call for Netflix and gather that information. So when we come here, you can ask questions as we go through. You can also sign up for the Netflix event at that website. Join us on the 28th of September. We also have access. If it's been a while since you've gone through our program, we have our online 13 modules covers the five drivers, the three financial statements, self-paced, great learning, testing, uh, social learning, moderated. Uh, we'll give you $100 off. You can, there's a code there that you can access to that. If you've never been through it and you want to get a deeper dive on that, absolutely highly recommend that. If you've got a large enough group that you can have us come in and do this for you, we can actually go through the assessment of your company, a deeper dive on what your company's trying to do, how you fit within the industry, and most importantly, how you can impact it. Well, folks, it's been my pleasure to be with you. Hopefully you found this to be helpful. Well, I and my team will stay on for the next few minutes and answer any questions you might have. If not, thank you very much and hope to see you next month as we look at Netflix. Thank you. Have a great day. Again, make sure you download that link and go ahead and access that stuff. Once you've got access to that, you're free to go. Andrea, great to see you again. Hope all is well. Let's reconnect. Well, folks, I'm on the line. Uh, team, was there any questions that were asked that we didn't answer? Interested in learning about more? Okay, it looks like we're good there. Interesting industry, oil and gas right now. Uh, oil prices dropped. It's down to below $100 a barrel uh, as we start to see things normalize a little bit. Still, it, the fact that Shell's able to run as efficiently as they can, even at a lower price, they'll still generate a decent amount of profitability and cash flow. So very strong performance for sure. Well, folks, so when Biden asked these companies to take less profits, do they impact gas prices? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I don't know how much control uh, any exec, any leader or executive can have on that pricing. But yes, definitely there's, com Dana, I would say it probably has a bigger impact on their stock prices. People take that and say, oh, no, they're not going to make as much. So worry about uh, what's going to happen to their stock price. But yeah, that, there's, there's definitely a big argument right now around Biden and others and other global leaders saying, look, uh, hey, you need to quit taking as much profitability. And I think the argument that the shell, whether it's right or wrong, I don't want to uh, weigh in or get uh, political by any means. I don't like paying for it, but I also recognize uh, the investment that is needed to get to these low carbon initiatives. It costs a lot to put windmills up. It costs a lot to do new technologies with hydrogen, geothermal. I got clients doing geothermal where they drill in the ground and they use the earth's uh, heating to be able to heat buildings. There's a lot of dollars that it takes to make it more efficient. There's some high carbon uh, resources that have very low cost, but they have horrible impact on the environment. So there's this balance between how much it costs you to invest. If they really want to get to uh, zero carbon impact in 2050, that's going to take a lot of dollars to invest in the technologies and innovation to be able to do that. The easiest way to think about is think about electric cars. When they first came out, how expensive they are. They, they're dropping, but they're still very expensive. It's a high cost item. Until it can be efficient, until the masses hit it, lower the cost per unit, it's difficult. And so I think that's their argument. There's high cost and investment to try and help the global economy. The security of the resource is a big deal. But yeah, as far as impact to commodity price, it may have some swing, but Jamin, I, I don't know that it's a direct correlation per se. Great question. And by the way, all the oil and gas companies, mining companies are going into these other um, low carbon solutions. So there's competition as well to get access to resources to be able to do that investment. I think all in all, it'll be a good thing, obviously, but it's, it's gonna take a lot of money to do it. Well, folks, team, any, anything else we need to, it looks like we've got about a few of us still on here. So if you're on and you have a question, happy to answer questions. If not, thank you very much. Just go ahead and leave. Make sure you get access to that acumenlearning.com forward slash webinar. That'll be a great resource for you to get access to the tool. Sign up for the next uh, one where we look at Netflix as well as uh, get access to that uh, online learning. It's great. It's called seeing the big picture. It covers the five drivers every company focuses on cash, profit, asset growth, and people. 
as well as uh, financial statements, a great kind of foundation to build upon. Then you add it to, to add to it, listening to these earnings call, and you can really differentiate yourself in your organization. Well, folks, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, let, let's see here. Bailey, I don't know if you have anything else. If not, folks, thank you very much for your time. We're going to start closing down. If you have any questions, please jump on quickly in the chat box. Otherwise, we're going to be shutting down. Thank you much and have a wonderful day. Great job. Thank you, Bailey. Let's go ahead and shut her down. Okay.